it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I, I'm not used to giving talks uh, to public aud audiences, and I, you know, I thought about what would be sensible to talk about. And I, one of the things is, I, a couple of weeks ago, I asked my daughters. I have three teenage daughters. Um, as you probably know, teenagers have a special way of communicating. Um, so, um, some would call it unfiltered. Um, um, and so I, I told them that I was going to be giving this talk, and I asked for their ideas on, um, on you know, what I should do. And they said, Dad, don't be a geek. These are real people. So um, I thought that was you know, sage advice. But the problem is that sort of tells me what to do. Um, it didn't really tell me how to operationalize it. Right? How do I go from what is my comfort zone, talking to geeks and getting them excited, to uh, talking to a different audience? And in many ways, it characterizes the fundamental challenge that we face um, in the next five years, really, that Dr. Brotman outlined of the things that we've identified um, uh, that we have to do. So we know what we have to do. The challenge is really going to be how do we do it, and how do we do it in a way um, where we know we're always improving. Um, and um, and so I, I want to just sort of walk you through um, scenarios. So let me let me um, begin by talking about uh, notions of research and development because it's a um, pervasive capability in most business sectors. Um, most major business sectors uh, that you can think of have an R&D capability. And the purpose of that, of that capability really is to move that corporate entity into the future in a way that it's much more competitive. Usually it's a good thing. Sometimes we get too much of something because of it. But ordinarily, it's a good thing because it delivers on what I would call the better, faster, cheaper proposition, that today we get something that's better and costs less than we got yesterday. That's, that's the proposition um, that R&D offers. In healthcare, so it's the biggest sector of the U.S. economy, um, uh, within which healthcare delivery is the biggest segment. So in most areas of healthcare, outside of healthcare delivery, we have an R&D capability. Pharmaceutical companies have it, device companies have it, drugs, have, um, labs have it. So they all have their R&D function to invent the future um, and to figure out how to stay competitive. And remarkably, in healthcare delivery, we actually don't have that capability. If you look at the largest healthcare systems across the, sun, the country, some do have um, uh, a research capability, but it's not a true R&D capability. It, act, it acts more as a sort of academic research model. And at the turn of the 20th century, the intention was actually to develop research in academic medical centers. That's what Hopkins and Mayo and the likes that sprung up at the turn of the last century were intended to do. The whole bench to bedside concept, integrating research with practice, was a concept that actually emerged um, uh, at the turn of the last century. And the idea was that we would integrate research with practice. Um, and it was a wonderful idea. It was incredibly thoughtful. And then around uh, the late 40s and the early 50s, insurance came around. And all of a sudden, a whole new world of healthcare emerged where the academic medical centers separated from the rest of healthcare delivery. And we ended up creating isolated pods of research that became knowledge generating uh, endeavors. Um, and the rest of healthcare really uh, was left without its R&D capability. So we really have to bring that back. And part of my interest in coming to Sutter was to take what I learned at Geisinger over the last decade and really take it to the next level. And Sutter represents, in my mind, something that's more proximal to the real world. It has a very diverse population that it serves. It has a very diverse set of markets. It has what I would characterize as every irrational element of the U.S. healthcare system in our market. And that's a good thing, because if we're going to develop solutions, it has to be able to be adapted to the many diverse settings that we have just here in the Bay Area. When I think of my role um, as, as head of research development and dissemination, at, et cetera, I think about uh, a mantra that keeps us focused. And one of the things that I think about uh, in the world that Dr. Brockton described is that the things that we want nurses and physicians to do are incredibly difficult. Um, and, the th and 
and they only have so much energy and they only have so much mental energy. You know, the, the brain consumes about 20% of the energy in the body and it, it, it maxes out. It can't consume any more than that. And when you tax it beyond that limit, we default to really fast and easy ways of thinking. So we're not going to get there by piling on more. Um, we have to find other ways uh, to reinvent how we deliver care that allows us to do more uh, in the same amount of time. That's essentially what we have to do. And in most other settings, the way we think about it is how do we make the best thing that we want to do the easiest thing? How do we design the world in a way where it, it becomes the natural default? You know, I think of my kids um, after dinner and um, how difficult it is to get them to put the dishes in the dishwasher. You know? They get it to the sink. Now, you might say that's progress. At least they get it off, off the table. But they don't get it in the dishwasher. They sort of stop part way. And it's because it's so easy just to leave it there. Um, and in many ways, if you look and dissect how healthcare is delivered, there are many things that are just easy to do because the alternatives are so hard and really impossible. So the how is really a critical question. And part of what we're going to build in our building at, um, at Sutter um, is the infrastructure to allow us to identify the best ideas, and I'm going to come back to this, to use the infrastructure that we have as a proving ground for ideas and vetting them, and then investing in those that really are successful. That we have to have a, a, an innovation engine that allows us to scale a discovery process and disseminate success in a way that other businesses traditionally do it. And we do not have that kind of infrastructure really anywhere in the US in healthcare. Now I know my, my daughter said don't be a geek, but I, I just want to sort of walk through this. This is my only geeky thing that I'm going to do with you um, in my talk. But this is, um, this is really an important graph. This graph speaks to something fundamental about human behavior. And this is a graph of data from 174 countries, as diverse as you can imagine. And it's a plot on the x-axis of the gross domestic product per capita. And on the y-axis, the total healthcare expenditure in that country per capita. Right? And they all fall along the same line. It's really quite remarkable. Um, and so we can't talk about spending on healthcare being part of the nature of some economy, because it, it doesn't seem to matter. It doesn't seem to matter how money is channeled or used or organized or how costs are shifted, um, there's a human element here that's common to the 174 countries. When I was a graduate student at Hopkins um, back in 76, so I'm dating myself, um, I had my first health econ lecture. And back then, um, the um, woes of how much more expensive can healthcare get um, were raised then, and it was my first introduction to it, and I had the same reaction. My God, how much more expensive can it get? It's 8% of the U.S. economy. That seems substantial. Last year, um, in 2004, it was 14.5%. And uh, in 2013, it will be 18%. $3 trillion. It's an extraordinary um, amount of money. And we're that data point um, out there at the end. We're not an outlier. Right. We're doing uh, what economists would say a society does. Right? What's unique and interesting about this plot is the, the slope of it's greater than one. And what that means is that as we get wealthier, we don't just spend more on health care. We spend a greater share of our wealth on health care. It's the last horizon. Right? So we're, we're willing to do more and more. Um, and there's something fundamental that's driving us because it happens everywhere, and it's related to how wealthy we are. And so the 18% that, that might continue um, is, is in part a product of how we're designed. It could be a midbrain disorder, it could be a brainstem disorder. The disorder is somewhere uh, in our brain, and we have to get to it. Now I say that the way that you get to the midbrain, the, the more primitive parts of our brain, um, the mammal brain and the lizard brain, the brainstem, is through the cortex. Right? because the cortex can be the dominant power sometimes. Usually, those more primitive parts often control our behavior, but sometimes we can reverse that. And the way that you get to those other areas of the brain is through two senses, um, talking or hearing and visualizing. Right? Those are consuming senses for us. And so we have to design things in a way where we have a better talk 
in the way that Dr. Brotman alluded to, and where we see things in a way that makes sense to us, where we share that information um, that we help create with our doctors um, in a way that makes sense to us. Somehow we have to come, we don't need necessarily more diagnostics to solve the, uh, the health problem. If you take these 174 countries and you plot them by quality, what you see is that the quality uh, metrics start to plateau at around 10% of GDP. So when you start to get to 10, 11%, it starts to flatten out. Right? And we're already out at 18%. And so what are we doing with that extra third? Most experts would say it's waste. About a third of that trillion, three trillion dollars that we're going to spend this year is care that we could do without. So, that, so we've identified something that, that we could really go after, but how you go out and get that is really a difficult problem. I think it requires that we have much, much better conversations with the patients that we serve. So what we have to accomplish, actually, over the next five years, um, in the way that Dr. Brotman described, is really something very fundamental. It's a fundamental shift. We actually have to change either the slope of this curve or bend it in some way. We're talking about restructuring how we behave because over the last 50 to 60 years, we've behaved in a way that we're wired and a whole economy has emerged to that dance. Right? It's, it's, and it's a fragmented economy. It's not as though everybody's talking to each other. Um, it's a response to the ways in, in which we behave and act. Healthcare is an incredibly complicated thing to figure out. Even the experts, when they have to use health care themselves, are challenged. It's really complicated. Um, and uh, it's even more complicated, of course, if you have a parent to care for. Um, in many ways, I often think, wouldn't it be fabulous if we had a GPS kind of device, you know, that you could carry with you? Um, where you could walk through and know what the options are that you're facing and what the pluses and minuses are for all the options that you have and how does it sync with your preferences. All those things um, seem theoretically possible. And I think they are theoretically possible. Um, and I think we may end up seeing those in the coming decade. The question is, how can we make them happen faster? So I'm not going to make any promises about that, although I'd love to have a, a, a GPS every time I, um, I go to see a doctor um, uh, to sort of know, you know, what's sensible to do. Um, what I thought I would do, you know, for the remaining time is go through some scenarios um, that are common scenarios um, and uh, sort of walk you through my dissection of those scenarios and what the challenges are. Um, because the challenges we face in how are really difficult. Um, they're going to take some significant uh, invention, really, to sort of overcome um, uh, the ways in which we do things today to transform them to a world that we can do the things that Dr. Brotman alluded to. Um, and I'm going to start granular. I want to start at the encounter level, and then I want to I want to talk about how somebody experiences a disease as it emerges and whether we could do something about it in the digital age. And then I want to talk about what a system means. How does a system sort of um, uh, help us um, with getting better care? So let me start with the encounter because the, the outpatient encounter and especially an encounter with our primary care physician um, is probably the most common kind of contact that we have with the healthcare care system. Um, and many of us believe that it is the cornerstone for transforming care, um, that, that the primary care physician is likely to play a key role. Now, we may lose a majority of primary care physicians given the data that we saw from Dr. Brotman if we continue to stress them, um, and it is a stressful job, and that we have to redesign things in a way where um, it's a satisfying and exciting job that can be done with a reasonable amount of mental energy. Um, but let me talk about the challenges with how the primary care encounter is structured. So, and I don't want to talk, this is not about earaches or, you know, a, uh, a fever, it's about perhaps more complex visits that we've all had, I'm sure. Um, and sometimes it, it begins with something that happens where you can no longer do what you need to do in your daily life and you finally say, 
I got to go to the doctor, right? We're not all rushing to go see the doctor. It's not the sort of top, top of our list thing. It's why I have my annual every three year physical. Is it's sort of uh, <laughs> trying to sort of stretch it out. Um, um, and, and you have that one thing, but then you, you know, there's, there are a couple other things that you've stored up and that you've saved up that you, you know, they weren't quite enough to get you there, but now you've, now you've got a list, right? You've got, you've got something that you, you know, you want to go for. It's a little like shopping, right? You don't, you don't rush to the grocery store to buy just one thing unless you absolutely need it. Um, and you sort of save up and go and get a number of things, right? So you legitimately have an agenda. Yeah? You're, you're getting ready to go, you make the visit, you're taking time out of your busy day. Um, you're going into what feels like a foreign world, you step into that uh, clinic, and you're clear on sort of what you want. So I'm gonna talk about um, back pain as an example. You check in. You're holding on to that agenda, right? It's clear in your mind. Some people are so good at this that they might even write it down, right? so they can't, so they don't forget it. You check in at the front desk. A little time passes, right? You're, you know, just getting into that um, um, Time Magazine article, and then your name gets called. Um, and the nurse does what we call rooming. So the nurse uh, brings you to an exam room, or it might be an MA. And this is not made quite explicit, but the nurse also has an agenda, right? They, they have things that they have to get done. Um, now, you have an agenda, the nurse has an agenda. In today's world, who's in control? All right? Your agenda probably is gonna come second um, because the nurse is required to get things done, right? We are packing more and more stuff in an encounter the duration of which has not changed in 20 years, the reimbursement for which has gone down, not up, and we've piled more work uh, on the people who have to manage that encounter. So I guarantee you that uh, the nurse is coming in there with an agenda and you can feel the time pressure. Right? They sit down, that your agenda starts to get a little cloudy because now you're a little hesitant about uh, when they ask you why are you here, going through all your list, right? So you might stop at back pain and then you kind of leave it at that and we'll get to the other ones. You know, when the doctor comes in, things will be a little bit better. So they go through their work and they're documenting things and you tell a little bit about your story and then um, they move on and then you have a little more wait time. I don't know about you, but when I'm waiting in the exam room, there's nothing to read there usually and I'm kind of bored, so I'm playing with some of the devices in the exam room just to keep myself busy. Um, so then the physician comes in and the physician has an agenda, right? Because the, the physician has things that they have to do. This is, this is not behaving badly. This is, this, they have to do certain things, right? And they also have a paradigm, right? They're listening to your story and their paradigm is to diagnose and to treat, right? So, and then you might start in with back pain, but you really want to get to that uh, feeling blue and that depression because it's sort of been lingering there and you, you didn't really feel like coming in, but now that you're here, you'd like to sort of get it out on the table. And, you know, there's a lot of Q&A back and forth and um, you discuss it and then the appointment ends and you got the back pain covered, but the other three things just didn't quite get to the list. And, um, and then you leave and uh, you remember half of what you were told to do and then you go home and you wonder what actually happened there, right? That was like a blitz and I'm not sure that I got the service. And nobody, quite honestly, nobody is to blame. It's, there's a structure to this that, that fundamentally doesn't work. It worked 30 years ago, but the way in which we've put demands on it um, makes it unworkable today. And I, I believe that the only way that we can really solve the problem uh, that we face here is, is with technology. And I'm gonna come back to that. Um, there's a wonderful investigator at Pamphrey. She, uh, the Pamphrey is the research institute at PAMF. And um, her area of interest is patient-doctor communication. And she does arduous work. It's really, this is difficult work because to understand patient-doctor communication you actually have to intrude on the encounter. Uh, you have to watch when a, when a doctor goes into an exam room and then you insert yourself in there, knocking on the door and say, can I get your consent to record this encounter? 
and so that you know you have to get the consent and then you put the recorder down and the patient's kind of looking at that and there's a there's a kind of a Hawthorne effect that may influence what you say or don't say but it's there and then and then they record lots of those conversations because the only way we can understand patient doctor communication is to record what happens um, and then research staff um, decode that whole conversation they transcribe it and then they evaluate it it costs like six hundred dollars to do one encounter and dissect it and this is just a graph of a conversation from a typical encounter and it's a patient who had several different things kind of like what I described um, that they wanted to cover but they couldn't get their agenda right there was only a few seconds spent at the beginning of the encounter to understand what the patient's agenda was because honestly there's not a lot of time we got a lot of things to cover I got to ask you questions about your problems and things of that sort and then I've got to get to a diagnosis and the conversation moves around I don't have time to go through the details of it but the nature of this is a lot of time is spent going back and forth right and the inefficiencies that come with going back and forth and the fragmentation of the conversation that comes with that and we could do a lot better with technology there really are are easy ways to solve this part of notions of patient-centered care which many people believe is critical it's a the theoretical construct really but they believe it's critical to our future is uh, a notion called shared decision-making right? this is a notion where the future about healthcare should be about us displaying things in a way where the doctor and the patient share together on the options and the patient's preferences and what makes sense to do. It takes a lot of time. It's not a reality today because we haven't invented a solution to make it a reality. But these are elements that many believe should be part of what we call shared decision making. So I wanna, I wanna come back to that when we talk about solutions. One of the, um, you know, as I get older, I think about how, uh, how I'd like things to end. I'm a realist. I know I'm not going to live forever. And, um, and one of my models for how I'd like to see things end is, um, is to live a long life where I'm functioning at 90, 95%, and then all my organs collapse at once, and I don't have any memory of it, and it's done. Like, you fall off the cliff, right? Um, and um, uh, and it, much of medicine, actually, is about... Um, trying to achieve that. You know, one of the fundamental problems that we have as we age is the organs don't cooperate. You know, the heart says, you guys are on your own, I'm moving on, and you know, it creates a real panic. It starts to go bad and all the other organs are left sort of uh, carrying the weight. Um, so we have this fundamental challenge that the organs aren't fully aligned and we have to figure out inventive ways to keep them in line so that people can have full lives. That's really, I think, what a lot of medicine is about. How do we figure out at a low cost to deliver full functioning lives. Um, and one problem, I'm just gonna spend a little time on one problem that is, um, is the most expensive problem that we're gonna face for the next 30 years, it's heart failure. It's a horribly disabling problem. Um, uh, patients, uh, when they're diagnosed with it, will likely die from it. Um, and it's inordinately costly. The best that we can do, um, the best that we can do is to try to keep people out of the hospital um, while their function declines over time. It's terrible. And the problem with this disease is that it emerges insidiously and slowly over time. Like this drawing, the symptoms come and go. They're in the record, right? And different symptoms that uh, collectively, if we could see it at once, um, we might be able to pick it up. And the problem is that in primary care, we always detect it too late. Um, to be able to do something about conserving cardiac function in a way that gives people a more complete life. So this, in my mind, is an area that is fundamentally important. You know, for most of my career, um, I've studied the brain. I'm, I'm a neuroepidemiologist among my geek friends. Um, and I became interested in heart failure at, at Geisinger. Um, not because I had any interest in the heart, but it was because I was surrounded by people in the health system who could not stop talking about this disease and how important it was to figure out how to solve the puzzle. And so I became interested in it as the head of research and development at, at, at Geisinger because I thought, well, this, is, this seems like a pretty straightforward problem. Let's just see if we can detect it early. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that. The third thing I wanna talk about is um, systems of care. Right. And um, 
And uh, I'm, I'm part of, and many of you are part of, what's called the sandwich generation. Right. The sandwich generation is a generation that has emerged because we've been so successful in healthcare that our parents have survived uh, um, decades longer and we have our own offspring that we manage and our parents that we increasingly care for. And it's demanding. All of us have experienced this. Um, and we don't have the information infrastructure to make it easy for us. Um, and when we have um, a parent or when an individual ends up in a hospital and then they're discharged, there's all kinds of assumptions that we make about the connectedness of a world that evolved disconnected. It's not that care is fragmented. It was never intended to be integrated. Um, even in integrated delivery systems, we struggle to put the pieces together in a way that's rational. And we imagine that there's a system uh, and at Sutter there is a system, um, and that in some way um, a connection will be made to uh, my primary care physician or my mother's primary care physician in a way that gives me some confidence. But this is an incredibly frail system. Try as we might to um, uh, connect the dots and connect the pieces. It depends a lot on human effort. It depends a lot on human memory. Frail um, uh, ways of connecting things that are not sustainable. And this is probably more than any other area in healthcare. This is going to be an area where information infrastructure will have a profound impact, not only on those who experience um, uh, care uh, in a more integrated way, but for those of us who also care for parents where we can understand it more deeply and go to a few key contacts to really understand what's going on. We are in the midst of a revolution. It hasn't happened yet. We're laying the groundwork. The last revolution in healthcare was at the turn of the 20th century. It was with the Flexner Report. This is an extraordinary, famous report. Um, and the impact was profound. Probably in the US, uh, this was among the most substantial intellectual advances of anything else that we could identify. The complete transformation of how we delivered care and the creation of an enterprise that was so successful in creating knowledge, so successful in its accelerating pace of creating knowledge, that we simply cannot use it. It's 15 year, it takes us 15 years to use new knowledge. So we have an enterprise that's generating knowledge at a pace that we simply can't, um, we don't have the infrastructure to use. Um, and we're now at the beginning of what I would consider to be the next extraordinary revolution. And I think it's going to be extraordinary. I think we're going to see things um, that we can't even imagine today that are going to um, achieve all those things in Dr. Brotman's first slide. The, the affordability, the access, the, uh, the quality. All of those things I think are going to happen. But um, innovation is a funny thing, right? There's lots of innovative ideas out there. Um, and um, one of the challenges with innovation is that, like most things, most ideas are just not workable. Um, they might work locally, but they probably aren't scalable in a way that anybody would really desire. So part of the innovation process um, requires that um, we, we really think about how we structure things so that uh, we have an innovation process that, um, that yields um, successful and scalable solutions. So let me talk, start first with the um, electronic health record. Um, and um, this is not the revolution, I'm sorry to say. This is sort of the platform for the revolution. Um, but it's an important starting point. It's a starting point that all systems and practices in the US will have to be on. There is no choice. Um, and what I think is revolutionary about the electronic health record is how it transforms what the medical record means. It's not just history anymore. It's not just something that gets brought up about what happened to you in the past. Your history in digital form is a clinical tool. There are extraordinary things that we are going to be able to do with the data that we collect, no matter what the form. Um, that inform us about things that we will want to discuss with you and things that you want to be aware of that you want to discuss with us. Um, and that's the real revolution, that the, that the record becomes a dynamic, 
invaluable clinical care document in a way that, um, that we've never had before. That to me is really the exciting part of the revolution. And an important part of that revolution is going to be apps, the development of applications. And I experienced this at Geisinger. I'll never forget in 2005 when I first brought up the idea that we should develop applications that interface with the electronic health record. And I had this very serious conversation with the chief uh, information officer. Now, these are people who have a view of the world that they're, they have two things. Um, everything else is fifth on a list. Right? They have maintenance and security. Nothing else really matters. And some geek is coming in and talking to um, this person about apps, you know, that this is where the real future was. So it took me two years, actually, to break through. And I, I was only able to achieve that because I convinced the CEO that this is actually where the future is. It's now the norm at, at Geisinger. But, um, of course, we've already seen a, a kind of revolution in how applications have taken off worldwide um, that help us with every nook and cranny of our lives. Right? And, and, and in many ways, it parallels the challenges that we face with healthcare. There is no silver bullet. There's not going to be one solution. There's not going to be something disruptive that all of a sudden we're in a whole new world and we don't have to worry about even going to the clinic. You know, I'll get my pill through the internet or something. Um, it, that's not going to happen. Right? We have, it may be, I don't know, uh, through the ether, but, but we have a long ways to go before we get there. There are a lot of people who are developing ideas that are a mile away from healthcare um, that have that kind of quality. Um, and that's sort of like that horse-drawn car. It's interesting, but it's not going to work. In order to really figure out how to develop apps to transform care, you've got to be really close to healthcare. And the reason why you have to be close to healthcare is it's incredibly complex. The data that we have is inordinately complex. There's no other business, perhaps, other than, well, there is no other business uh, that has as complex data as we have. The knowledge is complex. Only education probably has as demanding complexity in their knowledge base as, as healthcare does. And the interactions that we have, the human interactions that we have are complex, right? So this is not something simple like getting you to downtown San Francisco. This, uh, DPS, you know, where do you want to go? We'll get you there. It's a little more complicated than that, so it's going to take a little bit more time. But this technology is going to be fundamentally important to, to it. So how might it work? What are those scenarios like? So if I go back to that encounter with your agenda, your agenda should be documented, right? We should structure a process where we know your agenda. It's not very difficult. Um, we, we developed this at Geisinger where we integrated patient data capture tools with the encounter, where we asked patients about why they were there um, and to prioritize the reasons why they were there. And then we made that visible um, s with the physician and the nurse's agenda so that everybody could see what it is we were trying to accomplish in this encounter. Very straightforward concept. It requires that we use that downtime. Right? You have a lot of wait time. What we know from our past experience is that if we use that time effectively, putting the patient to work, they will be delighted as long as we share that data back with them. That's really a key part of the relationship. And so once we have that data, the encounter really becomes much more informed. It becomes part of the record. Um, we understand things in a way that we couldn't before. It influences the quality of the conversation. There are powerful things that we can do with patient data capture, and my belief is that the more we can think about asking people up front, and the more of that information that we can display at the beginning of the encounter, we don't have to spend that time trying to figure it out during the encounter. We now spend most of the time talking about the information that you shared with us. It's not a substitute for the conversation. It's intended to enhance the quality of the conversation so that the patient actually gets to where they want to be at the end of that encounter. It's a really critical function. Technically, pretty straightforward. This is not complicated. Displaying the content, fundamentally important. So you have to share it with the patient. And so again, that's, that's using it and sharing it and displaying it again. Let me go back to that heart failure scenario because in many ways, the key to detecting heart failure early is already in the record. All those symptoms that you saw, they're in the record. They are invisible, though, because they're dispersed over time. They get more frequent and more common over time. And we know from predictive modeling that we've done on heart failure that we can pick it up as much as two years earlier than a doctor actually picks it up. 
And that's fundamentally important because heart failure is a condition that if you pick it up a year or two earlier and you ask patients to take a pill that costs about a nickel a day and to walk a mile three or four times a week, they will get their cardiac function back and they can postpone that disease uh, for some time. So that is a, is, is a straightforward solution. But it's clear uh, from the work that many of us have done around predictive analytics that it's going to be a very powerful way of using uh, the electronic health record to inform things that we should talk about. And then the system of care, we really do have to connect the dots. We do have to have smart systems that um, allow a case manager to know everything they need to know about you that you feel they should know, that you want them to help you manage. And we are, we're connecting all the services uh, in a way that makes sense. And so we do need something akin um, to social networking kinds of tools. These are really sophisticated tools that have real relevance in the complex management that we have of patients with many different diseases. Because there are many different ways that we have to network and one of the things that we know about what happens when a case manager leaves a clinic, a medical home clinic, is that the whole panel falls apart because you've eliminated, you've created the black hole of information. So, so one of the solutions is going to be to build the information and social network tools that not only allow us to seamlessly understand what you need and your family members, but also if I leave, somebody can come in and be the navigator. I'm just going to close with two thoughts. Um, when you look at the pace of innovation, um, there are two things that really matter a lot. Uh, one is the rate of exchange of ideas. What makes Silicon Valley such an extraordinary place is that the rate of exchange of ideas in the Silicon Valley is at light speed. And things get invented the more you exchange an idea. The second is the cost of experimentation. Uh, one of the things that was so brilliant about uh, Thomas Edison was not the light bulb, although the light bulb was brilliant. Um, I don't want to take that away from him. But one of the things that was perhaps his greatest innovation was the insights that he had at a young age that failure is the norm. If you have an idea, there's a 95% chance that it's not going to work. But you don't know that until you work through the idea. And what, what Edison invented was a very, very fast way to get through failure. And he was so productive and so prolific because he had in invented a whole integrated way of doing research that got him quickly to the failures and then identified the few stars. So in many ways, when we think about in you know, innovation, we have to structure our world in a way where we have a high rate of exchange of ideas, but we profoundly reduce the cost of experimentation. And the way that we test things today, if I was at Hopkins, I apply for a grant that takes three to five years. We can't wait that long. Right? We have to learn to do and test ideas in months, not years. And we can only do that, really, by bringing research more intimately in contact with clinical practice. Research really has to almost be seamlessly part of the clinical practice. And you and patients really have to participate in that endeavor. It's a joint endeavor. It's a joint learning endeavor. Uh, and that's where we're moving. We're going to start organizing and setting up clinics in a way where we're doing research, but it's almost invisible, but we're learning more rapidly. So I'll stop there. Thank you for your attention.